Happy Father's Day to all of you dads, huh? Happy Father's Day. What a great day this is. We honor the dads of our church. And my dad is here today. Dad, would you stand up, please? We just want to recognize you and tell you how great it is to have you. All of us in my family are pastors, my, my son Ryan and my dad, so for us to have dad away from uh, the church responsibilities in Rockland and be with us, it's really a, a treat for me, so I'm glad that you're here. And dads, I just want to commend you today, because there's a lot of things you could be doing on your day. And there's a lot of dads that use this day as an excuse to do whatever they want to do. And you're in church with your family today, and I commend you for that. I compliment you for that. Men who put priority, yeah, give them a hand, that's right. Men who put priority on sitting in church and worshiping with their family. Boy, it's valuable for you to sit in church and let your children watch you raise your hands and worship and watch you open your Bible and take notes during the sermon and put some offering in the basket. Uh, There is some great teaching that's going on today, dads, and I compliment you. This is a church that has a lot of men that attend it, and I compliment you men for coming to church. I've been in churches where it's all women and children, and this is not one of those churches. There are a lot of men here. And so guys, I just commend you today for being that kind of a dad. Praise God for you guys. Our society says that you're valuable when you uh, earn well. You earn very well. The more you earn, the better you are. Your accumulation of stuff is where greatness is attached. But greatness as a dad is not demonstrated in how much stuff you have and how much stuff you're going to leave behind. Greatness as a dad are demonstrated in moments just like this where you are spiritually leading your family. At the end of this service today, we're going to take a special moment to pray a prayer of blessing over you dads. So we'll do that here in a little while. And I want to let you know, dads, I have a gift for you today. I know that when you get home, there will be gifts waiting for you. I know that you're going to get new socks and new underwear today. I know that. (laughs) Maybe a screwdriver if you're really, really lucky and your, your, your kids are buying tools. I remember one time I went down to the drugstore, and I bought my dad a Father's Day gift, and it was a lady's razor. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know the difference. So he got a lady's razor for Father's Day. Bless his heart. Still comes and sees me on Father's Day. That's, a, that's the power of forgiveness right there. <laughs> oh, boy. Don't give him a microphone, please. Please, please. So anyway, this all started going off the rails when I said I bought a gift for you. Um, after Mother's Day, I had given C's candy to all the moms, and the moms came and said, don't give C's candy to the dads. That's ours. Wow. So I went shopping I, with a mandate from the women that you men couldn't uh, have the C's candy. And I found these great packets, and I have one for each of you, and there are one, two, three pieces of chocolate in there and some other items. So we're going to take very good care of you dads today on the chocolate front and a nice gift, so make sure you pick one up on your way out today, okay? All right. I want to start a new series with you today. It's going to go three weeks in length, and this series is about some interesting characters in the New Testament. Honestly, these characters in the New Testament probably aren't thought of very much by you or very often by you. And probably true for most North American Christians, we don't think very much about these characters, and I think that that's pretty fair. For the most part, these characters don't get a lot of our attention, but they got a lot of attention from the writers of the books of the New Testament, the Gospel accounts and Acts. I'm talking about the centurions, the Roman centurions. And each time they showed up, it was made special mention of. Sometimes the, uh, the, the troops that they traveled with, the group that they traveled with was mentioned, but it always caught the imagination and the attention of the writer of the book when a Roman centurion interacted with Christ or another godly person or they were involved somehow in the life of Jesus. And they stop and they don't only just say there was a Roman there, they don't just say there was a Roman soldier there, they say there was a Roman centurion that was there. And these guys made an impact 
on the writers of the gospel. And around those impacts where those writers make special mention of these centurions, there are some principles in Scripture, godly principles, that I think we need to grab onto and make a part of our lives. So in the next three weeks, I want to look at the appearance of these centurion soldiers, these Romans, and I want to look at the principles that surround their appearance and what needs to be applied to our lives in the 21st century. Today we're going to start with an appearance of a Roman centurion in Matthew chapter 8. And if you'd like to grab your Bible, one of the church Bibles, we're going to go ahead and open to Matthew chapter 8, and I'm going to read a few scriptures to you, starting with verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, the soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Then Jesus said to the centurion, verse 13, Go, it will be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed that very hour. Each one of these appearances that I want to talk to you about in this three-week series has a principle attached to it that I'm hoping that you and I can understand and apply in our lives. Today, the principle that I want to discuss with you is that your faith has an impact on others. Your faith has an impact on others. We have fallen into a line of thinking as Christians that our faith is an enormously personal thing, that our faith has to do with us and God, and my faith with God is so that God can bless me and that I can have a good relationship with God. But that isn't the end of the story. All of those things are true, but your faith and your interaction with God has a bigger scope than that because your faith has the power to impact other people. Dads, your faith has the power to impact your entire family. Dads, your faith impacts your kids. Husbands, your faith impacts your wife. It's a big deal that you're a man of God and you're a man of faith because your faith impacts those around you. Young people, your faith matters. Your faith can impact your family. You see, this church has a lot of stories in it about moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas that come to this church and worship Jesus on a weekly basis that they didn't lead the way here. A teenager came and accepted Jesus and then brought the family. A child came and accepted Jesus and brought the family. You know what? This isn't an age-sensitive thing. Your faith impacts those around you. Your faith can even have an impact on the world at large around you. That's what missions giving is all about. We write checks, we give money in faith, and those dollars go across the world, and people are being led to Jesus that you will never meet this side of heaven because your faith is impacting their life. That's why we call it faith promise, because your faith is impacting people clear across our globe in a missions effort. It's a powerful thought that your faith isn't just about you, that your faith isn't just about getting in good with you and God, but that your faith has an impact on others. Now, along those thoughts, and with that in mind, I want to read verse 13 to you again out of Matthew chapter 8. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, it will be done just as you believed it would, and his servant was healed that very hour. The end result of his faith was the impact on somebody else. This man's faith would result in impacting his servant's life by saving his servant's life. Let's look at this account in Scripture, and I want to make a couple of uh, comments about it. In verse 5, it starts off like this. When Jesus had come, had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him. Now, that doesn't sound like much, and that doesn't seem very earth-shattering, and most people don't quote that as their favorite verse or the most impacting verse in their life. But this is an amazing thing. This is a simple sentence, but it's a big deal. 
It's a big deal to see a Roman centurion walking up to Jesus. As a matter of fact, for this man to get in front of Christ, there are some barriers and there are some obstacles that he's going to have to get over to be able to get in front of Jesus. And they're not barriers that Jesus put up. There are barriers that he has within himself. And friends, that same scenario repeats itself week after week after week in this church as invitations are made to Jesus and Jesus is standing ready to accept you, to love you, to have a relationship with you. And people put up obstacles and they put up blockades and they put up barriers and they say, I can't come to God. If you only knew what I've done, if you only knew where I've been, If you only knew what I thought or how I felt, then these barriers go up and Jesus stands waiting. And in this story, there are barriers and there are obstacles aplenty for this man to get to Jesus. And every one of them is going to be surmounted. And one of the great things about Jesus is when you decide that you want to be with him, he will reach past the barriers in your mind and in your life and in your world and in your society, and he'll make an impact in your life. And in this man, he brings these, these, these barriers. There's an um, ideology uh, uh, barrier. This man was, re- was despised. He had been rejected by the Jews. He's a Roman officer, and he's going to come to a Jew for help. There are issues of prejudice here. There's an enemy. There's an intruder who's now approaching a Jew. There are political issues of anger and resentment that showed up. Every time these guys walked down the streets, there was resentment toward them. Jesus had the power to span, to span that divide, to span the issue of race and ideas that created barriers. He had the ability to get past those and touch this man's life. There was a physical barrier. The centurion's servant was desperately ill, and he was miles away, yet the distance would prove to be no obstacle for Jesus. He has the ability, any place, any time, to bring healing, to bring freedom, to bring peace, regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the distance. And then there was a spiritual barrier. This Gentile was considered lost by the Jews, an enemy of God, an enemy of God's people. But in this situation, too, the barrier is easily spanned by Jesus. His reach, his impact, his help is not limited by anybody's spiritual condition. Your spiritual condition, your sense of feeling horrible about who you are and where you've been and what you do does not provide a barrier that God can't get around. God can reach straight to where you are regardless of where you've been, who you are, what you've done. Praise the Lord for that. There is no barrier spiritually that God doesn't have the power to reach through and change you. Whenever we see a person coming to Jesus... We see Jesus accepting, eager to interact. But for many, there are just a lot of barriers within themselves. And they just keep quoting the barriers. And on the other side of those barriers is a Jesus that wants to change and touch and heal and help. And today, before I get done, my friend, I'm going to give you an opportunity to tell Jesus that you want a relationship with him, and he will reach right past all the barriers and touch your life today. Before we quit today, I'm going to give you that opportunity, I promise. In this first sentence, we learn that this man comes to Jesus. In other words, he's going to get past a lot of barriers and obstacles to get to Jesus. But we learn another interesting thing in this very first sentence, that this man is a centurion. It's interesting to me that when these Roman soldiers showed up, how often the writers of the New Testament quote their rank and their position. They come on the scene, and there is special mention, intrigue, almost amazement, that these men's lives would intersect the life of Jesus or another godly individual. So who were these centurions? And why did they capture such attention? What was it about them that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, authors would begin to comment on their role in a particular snapshot of Scripture? 
In a book on centurions by Colonel Jeff O'Leary, we find out some of the following facts. The centurions commanded 100 Roman soldiers. They were battle-hardened legionnaires who had been promoted to centurion based on a minimum of 16 years of active battle duty at the point of a spear showing valor. They were able to carry 90 pounds of equipment 20 miles a day and to train under the harshest of conditions. The centurion was required to equip himself financially at his own expense for everything that he needed, his food, his clothing, his bedding, his boots, his arms, his armor. He was a skilled engineer as well as a finest combat soldier, and he held ultimate sway and, uh, over the welfare of every man who served under his 100-man century. The enlistment period was for 25 years as a centurion, after which time there was a cash payout and a plot of land given. Punishment in the legion was swift and severe, and at the discretion of the commander of the legion. Death was the penalty for fleeing in the face of battle or for feigning illness and not going to battle. Minor offenses were punished by the loss of a body part. To rise to centurion was considered the highest honor a legionnaire could obtain. The centurion always led his troops from the front. Roman centurions. They bore scars on their bodies from the battles they fought. Roman centurions, familiar with death, familiar with battle, many times they had held their own soldiers in their arms and they blew their final breath into their faces as death took them. They knew both victory and defeat, the elation and the grief of each. This Roman centurion in Matthew chapter 8 is home. He has survived thousands of days in hostile territory and has returned home. Tens of thousands would go to war and many of them would never be seen again. He gets home and his family greets him. You can just picture it. And yet one member of the household is sick unto death, his slave. And this centurion has seen death many times. He knows the signs well of one who's dying, the shallow breathing the cold skin and the gray complexion, and all the signs were there. Death was in the room. He's a centurion. He's powerful. He's strong. He has great authority. He's he's a wily survivor of countless battles, and yet, even with all that, he's impotent in the face of death. And he elects to go to Jesus for help. It says in verse 5, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, asking for help. Asking for help. Unbelievable that this strong, self-reliant, man's man, leader of a hundred, Roman centurion, is coming to Jesus for the purpose of requesting assistance. So he climbs over obstacles, and he finds himself face-to-face with Jesus in public dialogue And the Bible records this short but remarkable incident. The centurion makes his request in verse 6. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed with terrible suffering. The century teaches us here something about how to approach Jesus. Look in for a moment into this scene that takes place just inside the gates of Capernaum in full view of Romans and Jews alike. The oppressor and the oppressed are looking in on this scene. Do you have any idea what it would have cost a centurion once the news spread that he had demeaned himself to a position beneath that of an itinerant preaching Jew? All for the sake of a slave. His reputation, all of his mighty deeds would be called into risk. He approaches Jesus with humility. First of all, he's a Gentile, he's a Roman, and he's willing to come to Jesus, a Jew, for help. And Jesus understands the courage and the humility that are at work for this man to walk up to him in a public setting. Secondly, he starts his conversation, he starts his request with the word Lord. He acknowledges in Jesus' superiority. The title is one of respect and understanding. He sees something special in Jesus. He sees something great. 
Jesus responds in verse 7. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The response is very quick. It doesn't require any more conversation. Jesus has decided it's over, it's done. Something got his attention off of that small offering that was given. Jesus says, I will go and heal him. Jesus' response to the centurion was forceful. He says, I will. They're words of guarantee. They're strong words that mean that Jesus is not only able to span the barriers, but he's willing to span the barriers and take care of the problem. Here we see Jesus play no favorites. He's dealing with a Roman soldier. He's dealing with a Gentile who's worried about a slave, and Jesus is willing to engage. It's amazing what Jesus will do when you come to him honestly and with humility, and you're truthful about yourself and your situation. It's unbelievable what Jesus will do on your behalf. I will. I will go and heal him. A statement that puts emphasis on the Lord himself with the words, I will. He's not going to dispatch the disciples to take care of this. The I will is about who he is, what he is, and what he's able to do. It's the Lord himself that will go to the home of this soldier and take care of his slave. What in the world caught the Lord's attention to such a degree that he was willing to engage so quickly and go to this man's house. The first thing is that Jesus was moved by the centurion's love for his servant. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. The centurion is not approaching Jesus for his own benefit. He's interceding for somebody else. This isn't about his spouse. This isn't about his child. This is about his slave. This wasn't the norm for the day. You see, masters, Roman masters, cared very little for their servants. The servant should have been, by society rule, meaningless to him. Roman servants were held, held little more value than that of an animal. The Greek philosopher Aristotle said this, no friendship, and there was no justice that could be extended to inanimate objects, not to a horse, not to an oxen, and not to a slave. Because masters and slaves were considered to have nothing in common. According to Aristotle, a slave was nothing more than a living tool. The Roman law expert Gaius wrote, it's universally accepted that masters possess the power of life and death over their slaves. The centurion had no such ideas. This seasoned soldier, this man's man, this hardened guy has compassion for his slave. He was so concerned that he engages in personal risk to approach Jesus on behalf of somebody who holds the lowest rung in the societal ladder. The fact that this centurion cared for his servant set him apart. Jesus noted this exceptional concern and said, I will go and heal him. Jesus is also moved by the centurion's honest view of himself. Jesus extends the offer to go to his home. And in verse 8, the response comes. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Not only did the centurion have good perspective on his servant, but he also had an honest view of himself. He didn't wait for the teacher to wander away from the crowds and then come to him in the cover of night, nor did he send a dozen of his finest soldiers to escort Jesus to his personal home where he could make the, the request. He made the request in public, and he said words that no Roman would say that no Roman soldier would say, that no Roman officer would say, he told Jesus, I don't deserve, I'm not worthy to have you come to my house. Please notice that he didn't say, my servant isn't worthy to have you come. He said, I'm not worthy. Romans 12, 3 says this, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance to the measure of faith that God has given you. 
This man has a realistic opinion of himself as he approaches Jesus with a request. And the third thing is that Jesus is moved by the centurion's faith. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. My friend, every time you exercise faith, God notices it. There's never a time in your life that you're going to step out and perform something in faith, taking God at his word, taking the challenge that God brings you, taking advantage of the opportunity that God has afforded you, and you step out in faith. There will never be a single time that God misses it, that God doesn't take note of it, that God isn't aware of the fact that you're exercising faith. Every time you decide to give, God notices the faith. Every time you decide to witness to another, God notices the faith. He sees what you're doing. Your attitudes and your actions and the faith that are manifest, God never drops a detail. I guarantee you that every time you exercise faith, God sees it. He notices it. He notes it. Not only does God notice it, but he rewards it and he responds to your faith. We know that in Hebrews eleven six, that scripture starts off this way, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. And there's just a lot of times that we stop that scripture right there. We know that we can't please God without faith, so we exercise faith in the hopes of having a pleasing relationship with God. But the scripture continues. It says this, and without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. God is a rewarder of those who demonstrate and manifest faith. Faith plus obedience always results in God's blessing. Look at his faith statement. You don't have to come to my house. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. Without a doubt, this centurion had heard stories about Jesus' ability to heal. He knew distance was no barrier. He had that figured out. He understood that Jesus' power could be delegated by just a word. He knew that authority that Jesus held could make his slave well. And here he recognizes the authority of Jesus and boils it down into a statement. Just say the word and that's enough. In verse 10, Jesus overlooks all the obvious barriers, all the differences, all the racial problems, all the social problems. And the only thing that he comments on about this man, he doesn't talk about his rank, he doesn't talk about what he's done, he doesn't talk about the people he's killed, he doesn't talk about the battles that he's been in, he doesn't talk about anything. He looks at him and he commends his faith. Out of everything that Jesus could have talked about, he narrows in on his faith and then backs it up with this statement. I tell you the truth, those of you who are following me, I haven't seen such great faith in all of Israel. Unbelievable the attention that this faith drew. Many Jews had believed on Jesus, but Jesus was saying that none of them had shown the depth The sensitivity, the sincerity, the love, and the faith is this Gentile centurion. Verses 11 and 12, he uses this backdrop of this statement of faith to do some a brief teaching for a group that are struggling with faith. And then he turns back to the Roman officer and he says in verse 13, it will be done just as you believed. The servant was healed that very hour. My friend, your faith is a big deal because your faith isn't just about you. Your faith isn't just about your salvation. Your faith isn't just about you making God happy. Your faith has an impact on others. It matters to your family, Dad, the way you exercise your faith. It matters to your family, Dad, the faith that you have. 
It matters to this community the kind of faith that you have as a church member and us as a church in this community. Our faith makes a huge difference in this neighborhood for people needing to know Jesus. We are making a huge difference because we have faith. And people all around this church are benefiting. All around this community are benefiting because of faith that you have and that I have and that we have for this community. Faith matters to your unsaved dad. Faith matters to your mom. Faith matters to your unsaved brother or uncle. Your faith makes an impact. The centurion asked, just say the word. That's enough. I don't deserve to have you at my house. Just speak the word and that's enough. Oh, that we would just look to God today and say, God, would you just speak the word over my life? God, would you just speak the word and let my marriage be restored? Would you speak the word so that my wayward child would come home? Would you speak the word so that my pagan boss would come to know Jesus? Would you speak the word so that the money that I'm giving to missions every month would reach people for their eternity being saved? My faith has an impact on others. The centurion shows up in the marketplace, in a public place, interacts with Jesus, and Jesus hones in on his faith. And because of it, a slave is raised back to health. Who is it that is waiting to benefit when you demonstrate faith in your relationship with God? Who is it whose life is going to be changed because you stand up and say, God, because you say so? Your faith is not about you. Your faith is not just about you and God. Your faith has an impact on other people. That's our first principle. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Earlier in this talk, I made you a promise. I try to keep my promises. I promised you that before we let, we let out, I would circle back around and give you an opportunity to reach out to Jesus, promising that he would reach past the barriers and touch you and forgive you and accept you. I don't know what barriers you brought in here with you today. I don't know what obstacles you have packed into church with you today, but I want to tell you this, that if you call out to Jesus, he will reach past the barriers and he will impact your life today. I've been talking about faith. I've been talking about faith that God recognizes and the faith that he, that he honors. And where we start on this whole journey and this whole talk and this whole walk about faith is accepting Jesus into our life as our personal Savior. That's the first step of t- faith that we take. We ask Christ into our life and he forgives our sin and he becomes the Lord of our life. And what I wanna do is I wanna lead you in a prayer. And if you'd like to have a relationship with Jesus, If you'd like to ask Jesus to reach past the barriers and touch you today, I would invite you quietly right where you sit to repeat this prayer right after me. And God will hear every single word. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I know I've sinned. I know I've made mistakes. And today I want you to know I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please come into my life. God, would you reach past all my stuff and change me, forgive me, and come into my life? Thank you for hearing my prayer and changing me. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed and just lots of people are praying right now. And it's so important when you make a decision 
that you don't confuse it with an emotional moment in your life, but that you say it was a choice, a decision that I made. 